It's late winter on Dock 3 at Seattle's Fisherman's Terminal, and the halibut schooners are coming out of hibernation. They'll travel to Alaska in March and work four to six months. Some of these schooners are 90 years old and making money like they always have. Halibut fishermen can pick and choose their fishing days now that they own quota shares of the resource. Prices are good and the resource is strong. The quota system lets the schooners work when sea conditions are favorable and the market is right. The fishing is safer and the consumer gets high quality food. If you've got quota, the future is bright. These old schooners aren't the only world-class vessels in Seattle's dynamic distant water fishing fleet. Seattle boats forage from the tropical Pacific to the Bering Sea. They harvest millions of metric tons of fish and shellfish and support an industry that generates billions of dollars in annual revenues. It's an industry with a local footprint that stretches from Ballard shipyards and marine terminals to downtown office towers. Its operations span the North Pacific. Its markets are global. Surprisingly, much of Seattle isn't aware that this industry exists, much less that the major resources it targets appear remarkably sustainable. With linchpins of the regional economy proving less dependable than anyone imagined, commercial fishing represents a critical source of jobs and revenues. It always has. Today, the core of the North Pacific fishing fleet calls Seattle home. But seaports up and down the Pacific coast have put out the welcome mat, striving to lure away bits and pieces of an industry that may be best appreciated away from home. This is the story of the Seattle industry that occurs out of sight and largely out of mind. It all started with the codfish. White men reportedly discovered Bering Sea cod in 1857 when a cargo vessel bound for Siberia was stymied by ice. Crew members tossed fishing lines over the side in search of fresh food. They soon feasted on a fish that had long been a staple of the European diet but was believed to inhabit only Atlantic waters. The sailors had discovered not just the Pacific codfish, but one of the world's great continental shelves, a huge expanse of shallow water roiled by currents that cause constant upwelling of nutrients from the ocean bottom and stir the mixture into a rich, biodiverse soup. It may be the most productive ocean ecosystem in the world. The Bering Sea, I think, is probably as rich a fishing ground as any place in the world. There's just no doubt it's a very, very productive piece of real estate. Alaska's offshore waters would one day become the scene of global competition over resources that have replenished themselves with astonishing profusion despite decades of intense commercial fishing. This abundance would convince a reluctant United States government to sign the Law of the Sea Treaty that extended national boundaries to 200 miles offshore. The economic opportunity it represented changed the way we manage the ocean. Within a generation of the discovery of the Pacific codfish, a new industry would be born. Then, as now, Seattle was its hub. In the beginning, sailing ships left Seattle with flotillas of dories nested on deck. Even on remote northern oceans in the early years, fishermen sat and hauled their gear from the tiny dories. 
Ed Shields followed his father, Captain J.E. Shields, into the cod business. The family's Pacific Codfish Company was established on Puget Sound in 1911. Father, then son, would rank as the last remnants of the age of working sail on the northwest coast, plying the waters from Seattle to Alaska until 1950 aboard sailing ships rigged for cod. I first became involved with going to sea with him in 1934 on the four-mast schooner Sophie Christensen. Uh, this schooner could bring down almost 700 tons of salt-cured fish. Their fleet included the smaller ships Charles Wilson and C.A. Thayer. Sophie Christensen was the largest one that was in the cod fishing fleet and she carried 22 dories. The Thayer had carried 18 dories uh, in earlier years and Charles Wilson about 14 dories. 19th century fishermen propelled themselves with sails and oars and hauled their gear by hand. By the 1930s, a technological quantum leap provided the dorymen with little engines. The fishing day started at 4 a.m. with breakfast on the schooner. The fishermen would crank up their engine, one man to a dory, and run out maybe two miles, maybe five miles, to where each one of them thought was a place worth trying for the day. Uh, they would be very careful that they would never go to leeward of the vessel, so that if the engine broke down, uh, they would not have to roll the dory back against the wind. Each fisherman worked two lines, one on either side of the tiny boat. If he could catch a halibut, that made the best bait. Otherwise, he cut up a small codfish. There would be a five-pound weight on the end of each line and two or three hooks. And they would jig the uh, lines over the side when a fish bit, uh, bring the line in, take the fish off the hook, put it in the after fish hold of the dory and cast the uh, line overboard again. Twice each day, the dorymen offloaded their catches. The fishermen would come back around 9 to 10 o'clock in the morning and unload the first catch of fish, uh, come aboard, have their dinner, which was the heavy meal of the day, and then go out for the second trip of fishing, coming back about 4 o'clock with a second trip. Uh, the best day that I can remember on the Sophie Christensen, we had almost 17,000 fish. They would average uh, 12 to 14 pounds, so on that day we caught nearly 200,000 pounds of fresh fish, which is no small deal. Pacific halibut, the world's largest flatfish, would become the target of a much bigger fleet of Seattle fishing vessels. Bob Alderson manages the Fishing Vessel Owners Association, an organization that has represented Seattle's longline fishermen since 1914. He describes the birth of the halibut fleet. It's officially given on record as, as 1888. That's when the uh, railhead came into Tacoma and sailing ships like the Molly Adams came around from New Bedford. In the halibut fishery, sailing schooners briefly gave way to steamers that traveled farther and faster and carried more cargo. Early on, the Seattle waterfront became a hub of shipbuilding and repair. Maritime historian Jim Cole. I think that was probably uh, in the 1880s and 1890s when things uh, started to happen here. Uh, we were aware of the uh, halibut resource that was right in, in the Straits of Juan de Fuca. There were, were halibut steamers constructed here or converted from other types of vessels uh, in Seattle. From the beginning, there was a strong ethnic cast to the Seattle fishing industry. A lot of the, uh, the early participants in the fishers were from Scandinavia, and there still is a very strong Scandinavian component uh, in the halibut industry. And back then, you had uh, uh, Scandinavian uh, shipwrights, Norwegians, and uh, some Swedes and Danes who uh, built uh, very good boats. They brought that skill with them and the knowledge of designing the boats from um, their homeland. Early in the 20th century, the diesel-powered schooners revolutionized halibut operations. Nearly a hundred years later, 
Some of them are still working. There are some remarkable old schooner vessels in, in this fleet, uh, you know, the ones that come to mind are things like the Polaris and the Vancey, uh, built in the 1910s and 1920s, uh, and beautifully maintained to this day. Some of them are just gorgeous vessels. Well, there was approximately 150 of them built. To date, there's about 25, 26 that are still in use. So the oldest one is the Tordenschuld, and it was built in 1911. So it's got about nine years to go, and it'll be a century old. In the halibut fishery, the relationships are as enduring as the boats. In fact, our uh, contract we've had with the Deep Sea Fishermen Union that our halibut fishermen was done in 1914 as well. That was the first year of the contract. And uh, we just extended it uh, for four years. So that's going to make that contract a little over 90 years old. And uh, those crewmen have uh, a history just like our boats have a history. Completion of the Hiram Chittenden Locks in 1917 produced a freshwater waterfront that would become the hub of Seattle's boat building and vessel support infrastructure. Ballard was about to emerge as a fishing industry powerhouse. It attracted a, a lot of boat builders. There were a lot of them on uh, that canal. You, you know, Sievert Sagstad started to his um, yard in 1905 just below where the locks are now, just below where the railroad bridge is there. Then in 1916, he moved into the canal where the Sagstad Marina is now at the foot of 20th Street. He died in 1946, and by, by that time, uh, he had built 300 fishing vessels. The ability to move from salt water to fresh was a boon to the operators of wooden boats. You could get inside the, the locks and would not uh, have the, the problem with uh, the shipworms, the you know, Toritos, and be a little uh, less concerned about the condition of the bottom paint on uh, the boat. You know, you didn't have to deal with the tides, the rise and fall of the tides, and it was a pretty uh, serene uh, environment and, and a good place to work on your boat. Boat building and repair quickly became Ballard's signature enterprises. They still are. Early on, Seattle fishermen began to display a surprising conservation ethos. Contrary to popular theory, the halibut industry knew there had to be an arbiter between the fleet and the resource. The International Pacific Halibut Commission was founded in 1924 to manage the fish stocks in U.S. and Canadian waters. Yeah, the origins of the commission are with the industry itself, and we're well aware of where our roots lie for the commission so uh, there's a very strong commitment uh, both in both ways in that uh, with the industry to the commission and vice versa scientists and industry developed a grudging respect for one another and a long tradition of cooperation between northwest fishermen and fishery managers was established there is proof in numbers at the dawn of the halibut industry's third century the resource is historically large and stable Commission scientists have nearly 100 years worth of data to guide them. But at the heart of it still is this relationship with the industry, which is really what sustained the commission. In other regions, management tended to be viewed not as the foundation of stable resources, but as an infringement on every citizen's right to harvest the common property of the United States, its fish. And this is the difference between the Northwest and the Northeast. The Northeast is a basket case because they considered the rights of the individual to go out and plunder the resource as paramount. Around other parts of the country, when the, uh, what was then the Bureau of Commercial Fisheries uh, tried to get into the regulatory business, they, the fishing industry wanted nothing to do with them. Out here, if somebody complained about how the, the, uh, the fishery service was operating, our biggest supporters were the fishing industry. In Atlantic waters, political pressure once forced fishery managers to permit annual exploitation rates as high as 80 to 90 percent of the biomass of commercially important species. For the past quarter century, the North Pacific Fishery Management Council has limited Alaska groundfish extractions to about 15 percent of the available biomass. 
Yellowstone, we've had a very conservative management regime, and as a result of that, the fishing has not affected the, the trends of the major stocks to any significant extent. Throughout the early 20th century, salmon formed the basis of the region's biggest fishery. As always, Alaska was the scene of the biggest runs and most intense harvests. In the early years, the fish trap helped sustain corporate domination of the salmon fishery as conglomerates like the Alaska Packers Association, the Pacific American Fisheries Corporation, and Libby McNeil Libby proved too powerful for fishermen to contend with. When traps were outlawed in Washington in 1934 and in Alaska in 1958, independent fishermen became powerful factors in the salmon business. The old cartels gave way to smaller firms that purchased their raw product from a newly empowered fishing fleet, working the inshore waters of the Pacific Northwest and Alaska. While Alaska was and is the center of the salmon harvest, the salmon business quickly became consolidated on Puget Sound. Bob Morgan entered the salmon packing industry during World War II. At first, he tried to conduct his business from the Alaskan community of Cordova. He quickly realized that financing his operations, transporting his product, and communicating with his customers required a larger venue. Seattle. When I first went to Cordova, the Alaska Signal Corps had one telephone. I mean, you had to go up town to talk on the phone, and it might take you an hour to get to your party and, and, and communicate. So communication, transportation, and finance was the, was the reason. As the financial, administrative, and vessel support components of the fishing industry became consolidated in Seattle, the residents of resource-rich Alaska frequently felt diminished as if their business partners on Puget Sound treated them like a colony. There has always been an undercurrent of tension between the Alaska and Seattle components of the fishing industry. But in reality, the two regions are completely dependent on one another. It seems fair to say that Seattle is an Alaskan fishing port. Well, I've been in the business uh, since 1941. I don't uh, look at myself as a as a Seattleite as opposed to Alaskan. I, I'm, I'm part of the fishing business and I've lived in Alaska and I've lived in Seattle. Until the 1960s, most American fishermen labored on inshore waters in small boats. To seaward, they watched a steadily expanding fleet of foreign factory ships catch and process what they regarded as their fish. You used to be able to sit in Kodiak and see the lights of the foreign fleets out there fishing on the Portlock Banks. I think the Russians were in there fishing on shrimp. The U.S. government had encouraged the Japanese to establish a Bering Sea fishery after World War II. When MacArthur took over in Japan, he suddenly realized that he had 80 million starving people and that the Japanese literally didn't have an economy that could feed them and they were fish eating people. And as the United States was not using the northern Bering Sea themselves, why they encouraged the Japanese to enter into the fisheries as a method of getting food to the Japanese people at a time they were hungry. If the Japanese were first, there would soon be high seas trawlers from a laundry list of nations working the astonishingly fertile fishing grounds within 200 miles of this country's Pacific coast. King crab was the creature that put American and foreign fishermen in uneasy proximity on this country's offshore waters. When king crab legs and claws emerged as a centerpiece of the dinner plate, Seattle fishermen began building substantial new vessels to participate in what would become an Alaskan boom. John Shong was a crab industry pioneer. He had emigrated from Norway in 1960. Nine months later, I found myself in the United States Army. And uh, I thought that was a little unfair at the time. 
but uh, uh, looking back on it, it was uh, two years well spent. And I spoke very nice English till I got back to Ballard, then went to hell again. Marine Construction and Design, or MARCO, typified the shipyards along the Seattle Ship Canal that were crafting a new generation of distant water fishing boats. Wood was about to give way to steel. Peter Schmidt had established Marco in 1953. I was convinced that the vessels would eventually be built out of steel, so I think uh, we got the first order for a crabber, the Olympic. And of course we designed a totally new boat. Uh, it was a 94-footer. I got my first new boat. For that was the first Marco boat that was built. That was the Olympic. That was in 1967. We could take more pots and we could take more fuel and we could hold more crabs. So that was a, that was a, really a great boat. And Oscar, Oscar Dyson, he told me, you'll never pay for that boat fishing crab. A year and a half later, it was paid for. Conrad Urey was another Ballard pioneer. In contrast to the derby fisheries that would come to be measured in hours as too many boats crowded the crab grounds, Yuri remembers the early days when crab fishing was a full-time enterprise. And we left Seattle in May, end of May. And we fished all year. We would be gone two or three months, and then we would fly home. Someone take the boat for a trip for you, then you go back up again. And we came home for Christmas after, that, after the first one. Then you went back up again, and uh, then you came home in April. Across the canal from Marco, the Pacific Fisherman was building another fleet of venerable distant water crab vessels. The Seattle-built steel boats would come to exemplify fishing vessel excellence. Good boats, very good boats, and uh, they've earned a lot of money. It would be interesting to know what um, just the average one of those boats uh, has, has uh, earned in, you know, for its owners and, and during its lifetime. For a small fraternity of professional crab fishermen, the 1960s were a golden age. By the mid-70s, life on the King Crab Grounds was good. Too good. Of course, the fishing kept increasing. The number of crabs kept increasing. We got in on a bloom like everybody. They don't come around very often in our industry. It was really good money. It really made a lot of people very wealthy. The profits attracted a flood of new entrants from far beyond the ranks of professional fishermen. The king crab fishery became a gold rush, plied by speculators. Brought in a lot of new people into the business, into the fishing business, of all kinds, doctors, lawyers, you name it, who were bought into the vessels, and of course that's how it, uh, how it grew so fast. There was a tremendous amount of boats coming into the industry. There was no way it could hold up. Uh, it, it was, uh, the writing was on the wall, and uh, so we start looking around, what else can we do? With overcapitalization in domestic fisheries and foreign fleets predominant in what Americans regarded as their backyard, Ballard fishermen wanted change. They appealed to Congress for help in moving offshore. Their mantra was the term Americanization. Nobody was sure exactly what it meant. Foreigners were taking all of the offshore resources. We didn't have any idea what was there. I mean, everybody was focused on halibut and, you know, salmon, crab, and so forth. But this groundfish resource, which was huge, and of course the foreigners at that time were starting to come over and, and, and utilize it. U.S. biologists tried to evaluate the potential of what would become the U.S. Fishery Conservation Zone. All they had to work with was foreign data. I was one of the folks that would go back with state and uh, uh, some other federal people and be on a technical team and we'd meet with the Soviets or the Japanese or the East Germans alternating between Washington DC or Moscow for instance with the Soviets. And um, we'd put technical reports together, we'd try to get their catch statistics, we'd get the results of their research. The Soviet research, by the way, was really quite good. Fishermen met plenty of opposition in the other Washington. The State Department saw fisheries as of so little value to the United States 
that it could be used as a tool to negotiate with other countries. The U.S. government didn't want people extending their jurisdiction because it would uh, impede uh, commerce, our defense, you know, our naval uh, ability to run naval ships around the world. You know, politically, fish has always been a giveaway in this nation. Unregulated factory fishing had become a worldwide problem. It would trigger the collapse of groundfish stocks off the New England coast and the precipitous declines of species like rockfish and Pacific Ocean perch off Washington, Oregon, and California. As other regions suffered, Seattle fishermen wanted extended U.S. jurisdiction to protect North Pacific resources and pave the way for a domestic high seas fishing fleet. The Senatorial Alliance of Washington Democrat Warren Magnuson and Alaska Republican Ted Stevens would resolve the 200-mile debate. Magnuson listened to his constituents in Ballard. It wasn't that Magnuson himself knew that much about fish. It's just that his friends were in that business. And as such, he was going to defend them, and he did a beautiful job of it. The proponents of the 200-mile limit had a substantial ally, big oil. The oil industry was happy to let fishermen take the lead. You could have the weathered old fisherman standing on the deck of his boat, and that was the publicity that carried the day. And the oil companies were big winners because it then got title to the leases offshore that they wanted. And so it was uh, a partnership of uh, a marriage of convenience that turned out very profitably for both sides. In 1976, the Magnuson Fishery Conservation and Management Act extended U.S. jurisdiction to 200 miles and brought enormous resources under U.S. control. Well, if we're looking at, at, at the Pacific Northwest and Alaska, and particularly Alaska, you're, you're looking at uh, just ground fish alone, something in the order of 30 to 40 million metric tons, so a very, very large scale resource, some of the largest in the world. I remember doing a little exercise when I was still at the biological lab um, to try to get our headquarters people in Washington, D.C. to understand the magnitude of what we had out here. And I remember converting that tonnage of just allowable catch of pollock. If you assume certain things about how big is each fish, 12, 14 inches, and you lay them head to tail, they'd go to the moon and back six and a half times or something like that. The Magnuson Act established a vision of American management sustaining offshore resources and of American fishermen reaping the rewards of offshore harvests. Shong and Yuri were the first to confront the foreign factory fleets head on. I knew that in Norway there was some uh, factory trawlers and they were the only part of the fishing industry over there that wasn't subsidized by the government and they were making money. If they can do it, by golly, we can do it. Of course, we'd been fishing up there many years then and we had seen the foreign fleets, the Russians, the Japanese, Poles, Chinese, Koreans, you name it. In the, those years, the codfish had come back and there was a lot of codfish. The pair bought a derelict factory ship left over from a failed federally subsidized effort to establish a high seas fishing industry off the Atlantic coast. They christened her the Arctic Trawler. At the time, that was the largest fishing vessel in the United States. The project came to about six million dollars. I think it was 14th of May in 1980, we took off from Seattle and headed out for the first trip. First trip, they left in May, May of 80. They didn't catch anything for two months. It was sad and sadder. Uh, the first couple of months we were up there, we, uh, we didn't do so good, and uh, we were sort of chewing nails and uh, wondering what the hell is going on. After the initial frustration, their luck changed. We found lots of fish. We, they'd been gone two months then, and we found the tremendous fishing out there. <laughs> Basically, we wore the crew out in those in the next month after a couple of months or so then we got on them and uh, and filled the boat and brought down a load of about two million pounds of uh, boneless skinless fillets american fishermen had historically targeted high value species like salmon and crab they turned up their noses at groundfish 
Not only was cod valued at pennies per pound compared to dollars for salmon or crab, there was a widespread assumption that American labor couldn't handle the rigors of processing fish in a floating factory. That's totally wrong. The American kids, they worked just as hard and, and there wasn't ma very many trips we had on the Arctic trawler before they started to move into the management positions or the factory foreman and the, and the deck, deck boss positions and stuff. So that is not true. If Ballard's ground fish pioneers could contend with the harvesting and the processing, marketing was another story. Arctic trawler fish was caught processed into fillets and frozen within hours of coming out of the water. It was premium product, but America got its whitefish from the East Coast or from Europe. Customers wouldn't change their buying habits overnight. Uh, the marketplace wasn't there. We hadn't expected to run into the marketing problem. So that was, that was, that was a real surprise to us, that we couldn't take this fish that was number one stuff and get it to go in the American market. I think we sold the boat, in, if I recall, in 87. So we had it uh, fishing for seven years. It isn't always the best to be number one. A close second is sometimes much cheaper. In 1980, Seattle crab fishermen enjoyed their greatest season ever. When they went north the following year, they were stunned to discover that the king crab stocks had collapsed or disappeared. Seattle's distant water crab fleet had to find something else to do, fast. New entrants into the king crab gold rush learned the hard way about the ups and downs of fishing. Bankrupt vessels lined the wharves of Ballard. It was, it was really sickening to uh, go to Fisherman's Terminal and see those boats sitting there, you know, berthed, you know, two and three deep in, uh, for a while. Old timers dug deep and diversified. Diversification was the key. In those days, you could tender herring, tender salmon, fish a few crab. You just had to be afraid of high depth. Seattle's house-forward crabbers had been designed as combination vessels, able to fish with pots or nets. Most of them had stern ramps built in through bringing the, the uh, net uh, up on, onto the deck, uh, but it was plated over for, you know, while they were fishing for crab. Um, the smarter designers and builders put shafting in them big enough for higher horsepower engines to be installed uh, anticipating maybe someday they will have to be converted to uh, trawling. Jim Talbot launched the fishing style called joint venture trawling that succeeded in ousting foreign fleets from U.S. fishing grounds. His father had established Bellingham Cold Storage in 1946. Seafood was always a major product line. In 1973, Talbot visualized the economic potential of an era of 200-mile limits. If the Japanese were first, the Soviet Union had established an even larger presence on the offshore fishing grounds of what were about to become American waters. To continue operating on the Eastern Pacific, the Soviets would need an American partner. I thought, well, uh, I'll propose a joint venture between Bellingham Cold Storage and the Ministry of Fisheries in, in the Soviet Union. So I um, wrote a letter to the Minister of Fisheries uh, back in 1973 um, uh, proposing that, uh, that we join a uh, joint venture because it was inevitable the United States was going out to 200 miles jurisdiction as were most of the countries around the world and I could just think of the millions and millions of pounds that we could have over our dock. Given the political climate of the era, Talbot's proposal seemed absurd. The 1970s marked the depths of the Cold War. The U.S. and the Soviet Union were on the brink of destroying one another with nuclear missiles. American defense policy was termed mutual assured destruction. 
for man. The Iron Curtain hid Soviet society from Western eyes. Since the Sputnik launch put the first satellite in space, Americans harbored a dread of Soviet technological potency. There was virtually no economic cooperation between the superpowers. Talbot heard nothing for a year and a half. So I wrote another letter and, uh, to the Minister of Fisheries and said, uh, our uh, uh, postal system sometimes uh, doesn't get the letters delivered and maybe the same thing is true in Russia and perhaps it didn't arrive. And so anyway, there's a copy of the letter that I sent you uh, a year ago or a year and a half ago. And um, just within a couple of weeks, I got a uh, call from the fisheries attaché uh, telling me that they were um, uh, very interested in what I was uh, proposing. Within days of the passage of the Magnuson Act, a delegation from Sabriflot, the Soviet fisheries ministry, arrived in Seattle. So we negotiated for uh, oh, at least a couple of weeks and then we signed the agreement. Uh, officially, we were in business. The Seattle-based firm Talbot named Marine Resources was unique. It was the only joint venture between the United States and the Soviet Union. When the deal was done, Talbot and his team headed to Moscow. We're sure that, uh, that our hotel rooms were bugged, <clears throat> uh, always. And uh, there were times when uh, we'd find somebody in the room working on the bug. Uh, because it wasn't working well. And uh, they would uh, give some excuse about, well, I'm changing the light bulbs in the room or something like that. Uh, our uh, telephone in Seattle, I'm sure, was bugged by both sides. They opened offices in Seattle, Moscow, and Nahadka, the principal fishing port of the Soviet Far East. Talbot had a cold storage and a relationship with America's arch enemy. Now he had to determine the nature of his business. It quickly became clear that neither politics nor economics would permit Soviet motherships to deliver product to Bellingham. He hired federal biologist Wally Pereira to conceive the venture. Pereira understood that the obstacle keeping American fishermen off the high seas fishing grounds was the absence of a domestic processing sector. And so that's that was really one of the motivating factors. The Magnuson Act, plus the, the fact that the, the Soviets at that time had in excess of two million uh, gross tons of capacity, fishing capacity. They had, you know, motherships all over the world. And so it was the opportunity maybe to work out an arrangement whereby we could, uh, you know, have American fishermen delivering to foreign vessels. That was really the motivating thought in my mind. They would test the concept by fishing for Pacific whiting off the Oregon coast and transferring product to a Soviet mothership on the high seas. Pereira approached Oregon trawler man Barry Fisher. He was very skeptical because he, he was fishing along the coast and was getting you know the traditional prices for, for the, the flatfish species. But we're talking about whiting. That was, that was the initial species, or hake, as it was called then. And um, I had to show Barry that if you could fish whiting at a nickel a pound and be able to deliver you know, substantial quantities of it at sea, you, your costs would be much lower, and the volume of fish that you'd be able to move would make that profitable for you. The idea of, f of having a factory ship follow me around to immediately take my production that that production would be in the nature of 50, 60, 70, 80 tons a day. The price could be very low to pay both paid to us and that the consumer would pay and it would be a high quality product because it was processed so fast. Fisher and his American counterparts would have to make substantial investments in boats and gear. They would have to teach themselves the fishing method called midwater trawling. It was a gamble. 
And the Soviets weren't told much either. They showed up off our coast with orders to look for a boat named the Lady of Good Voyage, and the captain's name was Barry Fisher, and he was going to go on a joint venture with him. And we're trying to prove that he can catch enough fish to keep the factory ship going. But we didn't get the political permission to go until 1978, 1978. There was only about a month left of the season. During that month, we taught ourselves to midwater trawl. For 10 days, it was no sleep, gear foul-ups, uh, not getting the net fished right, uh, snarling it, putting it on the bottom, tearing it up. And those were pretty bad times. Pereira and his Soviet counterpart within Marine Resources, Valerie Latichev, were aboard Fisher's boat as observers. Pereira noticed the difficulties and ventured a suggestion. Barry was just pulling his hair. He had this new vessel. It wasn't he'd have some problems with the vessel. Then he was having problems with the nets and the doors and every and he was just beside himself and it was hot. And I can remember to this day, you know, Barry up there in a wheelhouse, he had to with this had this um white t-shirt on and his hair was all awry from running up and down and so forth. And and Larry and I were up in the wheelhouse and so I, I said, Barry, I said, you know, I've been watching what you've been doing in there. You know, you might, uh, you might want to do, and before I ever got the word out of my mouth, Barry turned on me like, and I, you know, and he, I can't, I can't repeat what he said, but <laughs> the longest short of it is, you get out of the wheelhouse, there's only room for one, there's only room for one captain on this boat, and I'm the captain, <laughs> and he, he says, I don't want you up here anymore. And then the last 10 days of that month, everything clicked. And I put in over 800 tons in 10 days. The Soviet captains liked to test drive the high-tech American trawlers. They held the American captains to 35-ton catch limits. Because anytime we'd make a delivery, it had to be 35 tons. But when they got there, they wanted Bolshoi. They wanted, you know, they wanted big, big caught in to deliver, to show that they were good fishermen, you know. So the trade was fun, too. It was totally against the totally against the laws of both countries, but we were trading blue jeans for, blue jeans for fur hats, rock and roll cassettes for balalaika you know, music. Uh. The, the relationship between the fishermen and the Russian vessels became very personal. I mean, the captains, the, the captains got to know each other, um, and there was, there, there was you know, general, genuine warmth between the, between the both sides, and I think that's one of the reasons why it was successful. It, it, we rapidly built a camaraderie, and that, that cement, that was the cement that made the joint venture succeed. Marine resources operated on a barter system. The Soviets got paid in hard currency. Marine resources got paid in king crab. Uh, for example, a, a, ton of, uh, a ton of frozen king crab was, I think, 26 and a half hake units. So that meant that for every ton of king crab that we got as barter, they got um, 26 and a half tons of hake. The Soviet processing hands were paid on a share basis. The more they produced, the more they earned. The Soviet government hadn't counted on profit-motivated productivity. That first year, they wound up making, uh, making far more than very senior people in the government. For example, the, the, the fish factory workers were making more than an admiral in the Soviet Navy. Of course, by the next year, they they readjusted it downwards. American fishermen made a lot of money. Mellingham Coal Storage made money. Sauberflot made money. It was really good business. Enterprises like that should oftentimes be considered as probably the most valuable way that, that any two societies can get along with each other. It was economically profitable and socially it was a lot of fun. And philosophically I think it taught both of us on both sides a lot about things that we'd always taken for granted. And it, uh, it totally destroyed the idea that the Russians were the bad guys. A second wave of joint ventures involving Japanese and Korean motherships quickly eliminated foreign fishing in U.S. waters altogether. 
The Seattle fleet proved it could catch fish as well or better than anyone else in the world, but there was another side to Americanization. Domestic processing of offshore resources was the last mountain to climb. It would be a veteran of the Arctic trawler experiment whose fishing venture struck gold. In little more than a decade, Chell Rokey's American Seafoods Company would take him from factory hand to among the richest men in Norway. Bernd Bodal was an early partner in the business, now its chief executive. I actually think Chell had a fortune of having a thousand dollars for his ticket over here. I borrowed a thousand dollars to get over here and that was the only capital I had, the negative capital I had when I came here in 78. Rokey signed on with the Arctic trawler. He made an early impression when a bag of fish split in half before they could get it aboard. The next thing I knew, he had a couple of needles in his pocket and he ran back on the bag and sewed it up. And we saved the tow. Uh, it was nice weather, but even so, you know, he was, uh, he was 100 feet behind the boat uh, sitting on a, on a bag of codfish. <laughs> and I thought, geez, you know, I wouldn't have done that. The Magnuson Act had created a Mount Everest of opportunity for American fishermen and international capital took notice. Displaced from their historic fishing grounds, the Japanese invested heavily in Alaska shore plants. With its own factory trawler industry plagued by overfishing, Norway's banks financed much of the offshore processing sector. The Norwegian uh, government gave uh, cash subsidies, so with the cash subsidies people could uh, sometimes more than 100% finance uh, the boats. You had a a financing vehicle in, in Norway whereby the Norwegian government in, in, in an effort to provide employment opportunity in some of these, these small shipyards they had that, you know, they're, that are scattered throughout the fjords up there, um, they were willing to subsidize 